Interestingly enough, fat does seem to impact how our body processes and uses insulin and glucose, how this whole facilitation works. There's a lot of people that don't want to talk about it because it's not exactly exciting or cool to talk about how fat negatively impacts glucose metabolism. But there's a lot to be discovered there, and I want to be able to highlight some of the research so we can take a look at the big picture. But it also opens our eyes to some really interesting things we see in even seemingly healthy people that have elevated levels of glucose throughout the entirety of the day. So let's go ahead and jump into this and how fat affects insulin resistance. Down below, there is a link to save 25% or more off your initial grocery order through Thrive Market. Okay, Thrive Market is a really cool thing. It's where you go online, you get your groceries online, and then they get delivered to your doorstep. Well, a couple of cool benefits there. Number one, if you are going to a grocery store, it is a way, way, way easier mistake to grab foods that you are craving while you're at the grocery store. Ordering groceries online has been a game changer for me making better conscious decisions on what I put in my household for myself and my family. So that is a huge kind of emotional thing. But the other side of the equation is Thrive has all kinds of really cool products that A, you're probably not gonna find in a regular grocery store, and B, if you do find them at a regular grocery store, you'll probably find they're less expensive through Thrive Market. Plus you get a free gift because you're watching the Thomas DeLauer channel and you get to take advantage of that special offer down below in the description. So check them out after this video. There was a study that was published in the journal Scientific Reports. It took a look at 14,807 people. And I absolutely love this study because it is almost undeniable, okay? In the world of science research, correlation does not always equal causation. But the more data that you have, the more promising things look. And then you work backwards and you start getting more mechanistic and things like that. Well, in this particular study, they took subjects and they did what is called a DEXA scan, which is sort of like a CT scan of their muscle and their body to see how much fat and muscle they have. So they divided these 14,807 people into three categories. People that had high amounts of fat and low amounts of muscle. People that had high amounts of muscle and low amounts of fat. And lastly, people with high amounts of muscle and high amounts of fat. Now, People that don't like to believe that fat might play a role with insulin resistance would assume that the high muscle and high fat group combined, like the high muscle, high fat, would have the same results as the high muscle, low fat group. Wrong. The high muscle, low fat group had significantly less insulin resistance than the high muscle, high fat, and definitely way more than the low muscle, high fat. So we're looking at a pretty interesting dynamic here. What is the potential correlation or the causation here? We don't really know 100%, but I have mentioned in other videos that inflammation plays a big role in how this whole system works. So connecting dots here, there's something that's called the JNK pathway. This JNK pathway gets activated by inflammatory markers, like C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, interleukin-1-beta, some of these things, right? The more fat tissue that we have on the body, the more inflammatory cytokines we usually have circulating. Okay, that is a correlation that is pretty commonly known, that excess body fat and excess energy intake is associated with inflammation. The more inflammation we have, the more activation of the JNK pathway that we have, which interferes and decreases what is called insulin receptor substrate one. Insulin receptor substrate one is what ultimately facilitates the insulin signaling at a cellular level. So in essence, the fat triggering this inflammation can trigger this static that makes it difficult for the cell to receive a signal from insulin, meaning when you eat carbohydrates, your pancreas might be doing the work properly by secreting insulin, but the cell is not opening the door, it's not recognizing it. This is a big problem and when you're consistently flooding yourself with inflammation, you have to pay attention to this. But then there's some other pieces that we have to look at. There are something that are uh, something called intramyocellular triglycerides. Now that means it's basically little bits of fat, triglycerides that are weaved into your muscle fibers and weaved into your tissue. Pretty normal thing. There's a study that was published in the journal Nature and Science of Sleep. Okay, fascinating because it found 
that higher levels of intramyocellular triglycerides, higher levels of these fat deposits weaved in through our muscle, actually linked to better performance. We have better performance in terms of aerobic capacity, better anaerobic performance, and also lower insulin resistance. This is interesting, okay, and I'll explain why, because there's a little bit of a, of a toss-up here, interesting situation. Now, it would make sense from a performance standpoint that higher IMTG would, would be helping us, because IMTG acts as sort of a staging area for fats in some ways. So fats can be like liberated and then they kind of circulate and then they go into IMTG and IMTG, that's probably the quickest place that our body is going to pull from fat stores to use for fuel. So if you were a runner, for example, and you were doing some endurance work, it wouldn't surprise me if you had a decent level of IMTG, intramyocellular triglycerides, because these fats are readily available to be used at the musculoskeletal level when you engage in athletic activity and you go for a run. Makes perfect sense. So in this type of person that is athletic, that has high levels of IMTG, we actually see that it could be beneficial. But, here's a big but, could it be beneficial simply because that person is active, or is it beneficial because the IMTG is present? Well, it's a good question. And then there comes another study. This study was published in the journal Diabetes, and it found that when levels of IMTG, intramyocellular triglycerides, were high, they found that generally speaking, it had a negative correlation, increased insulin resistance. So, it really begs us to look at the subject pool. In the journal Diabetes, perhaps they're looking at more inactive, sedentary people or a different phenotype altogether. So when they have these high levels of fat in their muscles and they're potentially insulin resistant already, the body, the cells, are going to use the fat that is in the muscle first, therefore making you potentially less efficient at using glucose. If you had two cups, one cup full of fat and one cup full of sugar, but the cup full of fat was twice as big, your body would probably want to sip on the fat because you have more of it available. It becomes preferentially addicted to that, meaning your glucose metabolism takes a back seat and you get less efficient. It's almost like peripheral insulin resistance or poor glucose tolerance. And this can happen in athletes too, because what can happen is the intramyocellular triglycerides can get so elevated because you're using fats so much that they actually become less efficient at using glucose. This happens to me from time to time. If I fast a whole lot or anything like that, and I get so efficient at using fats, I find my glucose levels will elevate. This doesn't mean that it's the end of the world, but it's something we all need to pay attention to. The level of fat that we have on our body does dictate how much insulin resistance we may have. And that's exactly why you see when people first get diabetes or they first become pre-diabetic or anything like that, a lot of times they'll lose weight first and then they start gaining weight. And that's simply because the body is rejecting or not using the glucose, so they start to kind of waste away a little bit. And then as insulin levels start to stay high and remain high, that interferes with the, basically the lipolytic effect of the body in the first place. It interferes with hormone sensitive lipase, it interferes with all these things that normally allow us to burn fat. So then the weight starts creeping on. But that kind of brings us back full circle to which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did someone gain fat first and then become insulin resistant? Or did they get insulin resistant first and then get fat? This study, these studies that I'm talking about, indicate that it could come from being fat first, which is very, very interesting. And when you look at the data, once again, just a five to 10% or even a five to 7% reduction in your overall body weight can make a tremendous difference in your level of insulin resistance. So the bottom line here is lift weights, build muscle, and try to lose some weight. And it doesn't need to be much. At the end of the day, it's that simple. I hate to put it like that. There's a lot of different things you can do and that's what my channel is for. But as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.